Join us as we go on the road in a country many claim as their homeland, but only few call home. An ancient land that has stood the test of time, yet still surprises with timeless treasures. A landlocked nation with a proud history preparing to enter a wired world. Join us as we journey through Armenia. We begin in the capital Yerevan. After 23 years of independence, there's evidence that this tiny nation is finally starting to shake off its Soviet past. The signs along Lenin Avenue have been changed to Mashtots Avenue, a 5th century monk who invented the Armenian alphabet. You see more Western luxuries, more traffic, and more access to technology. At a new cafe, a younger, well-connected generation gathers on a Saturday night, most of them students, here to hang out, play games, and relax. In a novel concept, drinks and snacks are free. You just pay for your time spent. During the week, it's a place to do work, hold meetings, and share ideas. I think our generation is very transitional, let's say, generation. The cafe owner is only 29 years old, but she still remembers the hardships of the 90s, living with blackouts, no heat, and little opportunity. I, I see such a big gap even between my generation and uh, nowadays kids. They are 18, but they do uh, have their business. They are doing something in art. They are confident. They believe in the future. I don't know. Yeah, I'm jealous of <laughs> this generation. <laughs> Armenia's new internet generation. They are talented, ambitious, and they have just been handed the keys to the castle. The most surprising is when they come here, they're different. Suddenly everything changes. Uh, it's amazing. It's the power of what we have created. We're at Tumo Center for Creative Technologies, located on a shiny new campus overlooking Yerevan. <laughs> this revolutionary new school turned Armenian education on its head when it opened its doors three years ago. Armenia doesn't have natural resources. Our borders are closed right now. I hope that'll change soon. But right now, our link to the outside world is through to the virtual, uh, virtual networks. So. In a country still trying to retool its economy, state educational resources can only go so far. TUMO has helped fill in the gaps. It's really crazy to see something like this exist here, but it's also a, a beautiful illustration of the developing country that Armenia is. It's, a, it's an after-school university. It's a glorified after-school program. The idea is to get the entire figure down on paper in two minutes. A non-profit venture funded by an Armenian couple living in the United States, TUMO is free for students. The goal? Create a unique learning environment that gives children their best chance to make it in a digital world. When we started, uh, we thought about, one, a big space, like not to affect a few people, a few kids, but mass. Uh, that was important. It should be somewhere where you feel comfortable, where it's all about you and what you are creating on your screen. They have the opportunity to explore the areas that, that are interested in. Students can focus on computer animation, web development, game development, or digital media. The classwork is designed to inspire Armenia's next generation of creators. We pride ourselves on the fact that the majority of our students in the music team they have zero background in music. What matters for us is kind of that passion and the drive. So they come in here wanting to learn, and then we start from there. And the results can be stunning, whether it's hands-on workshops like this, or the production of original music videos, the level of expertise and talent shines through. <laughs> This is going to be the music scene. Everything that we're exposing them to, think about it, they're 15 years old. You know, 
five years from now they'll be 20 and they'll start working. Me rotation, me rotation. And that's really what it's all about, setting Armenian kids up for real-world jobs. Tumo brings that opportunity right in-house by renting the top floors out to tech startups. The kids aspire to work in companies like the ones are literally for the, the companies upstairs. They see a, a, their future right above them. Pixart is the number one photo editor, especially on, uh, on Android. 50 million users around the world are using our product on a monthly basis to create something cool and share to the world. Armenian success story Pixart is already expanding on Tumo's top floor. By combining outside investment and local talent, they have built a company that is competing on an international scale. Startups and innovation is going to be like a very important part of, you know, country recovery, if you want. I, I'm happy to be part of it. Yeah? So where does all this brain power come from? Many Armenians point to their love of chess. Chess and the Armenians' aspiration to be excellent in chess speaks more about people's mindset and their respect for intellectual pursuits. Across town, in a much different after-school program, parents gather to watch their children match wits and willpower at the country's elite chess academy. These are the best and the brightest, aspiring grandmasters who come from schools across Armenia, where chess is now a required class. Even in this high technology age, people need to think. If you are not trained to think from young age, you can't make correct decisions. Like Tumo, the coaches here train young minds to excel and compete on the world stage. But as the academy's director points out, chess may help them win in a wired world too. Chess is great for this century. Technology evolves so fast, people don't have time to think in order to press the buttons. Chess allows us to think and press the buttons at the same time, the right buttons. Uh, there is my superhero that I have made. Pressing the right buttons, it's exactly what the children are doing back at Tumo. Three times a week, they come from all around the capital just for a chance to log on and learn. His superpower is calling milk to fight with uh, pet ninjas. I promise that I will be a good animator to make famous uh, Armenia. To begin to understand the soul of Armenia, you must first visit this austere memorial overlooking the capital, Yerevan. The collective memory of an entire people is centered right here around the horrific event which it commemorates, the Armenian Genocide. It is a stark reminder of a seismic crack in Armenia's long, proud history when a million and a half Armenian Christians living in the Ottoman Empire were massacred. It is very powerful, the way it is uh, built and the architecture and the landscape. It was built in 1965 on the 50th anniversary of the genocide. Uh, in the time when within Soviet Union this topic was not very encouraged. It really turned into a symbol of national unity and kind of a reawakening of national tradition. Another mobilizing force that has unified the country for centuries is the Armenian Church. Armenia was the first nation to declare Christianity its official religion in 301 AD. Today, incredible cathedrals and monasteries dot the countryside, perched above breathtaking views or nestled in rough, mountainous hideaways. Powerful connections to a proud past. Traveling outside the capital Yerevan, we find one of the church's crown jewels, Gegard Monastery a 13th century architectural wonder carved right out of the surrounding mountainside. You can feel the energy there. 
Meanwhile, which is very calm and very zen. It's because there's huge energy there. Our guide through Gegard is Mirushan Minashian, a young architect in awe of its complex beauty. For me as an architect, it's incredible to imagine to curve out something like this, even with today's equipment, the advanced technologies, it's like almost impossible. I'm really proud of the people who did it and I'm pretty much sure they had a very big vision. As you can see, this is a car from inside the stone and you can see how perfect they imagined the dimensions and how accurate they did everything. Many religious sites in Armenia were destroyed by earthquakes or torn down by the Soviets. The ones that remain serve as reminders of a much larger, more dominant Armenia. When they're coming here the, the, from the most of the people and they're trying to find their roots. These places are for me, it's like the time traveling things that you're traveling through the time and going so deep. And honestly, sometimes you can feel them. When you're singing and uh, when you're hearing your son coming back, again it's give you something uh, to focus on yourself. Where are you, where are you going and what's the message that these people try to send you? Coming. Marushan visits a friend's house just down the road in Garni. Hello. Hey. Come on in. The host is Arthur Inspirian. His family's home overlooks the Garni Temple. Now, before exploring, they sit down and enjoy a gorgeous Armenian tea. We have a dessert table, organic fruits, everything from this garden, everything, uh, including tea, including this juice, and we call this unap. Yeah. It's not popular, but it's very tasty. Tasty, it is. Mm -hmm. Walnut is very popular in this uh, um, in village, Garni. Very tasty walnut. I'm going to, I really, really like the anab. It reminds me of my childhood. You can take it with you. <laughs> <laughs> take your childhood <laughs> with you. Arthur is a music artist. He lives in the capital, Yerevan, and travels the world, but finds his inspiration right here in his family village. When I come here, totally diff different feeling, yeah. This nature, this smell, this uh, eyes, uh, villagers' eyes, the pure eyes, it gives me something that after I go to my studio, it helps me to create more. The temple in Garni is a first century pagan relic that was destroyed by earthquakes. Arthur can remember it being reconstructed when he was a child. I'm very proud that we have this and thousands of tourists, they're learning more about Armenia. Arthur, connecting to the past has always been very important. As an Armenian jazz singer, he knows great things can come from reaching back. I see the young generation that sometimes they ask me, why are you doing the old music? I'm, I'm building a little bridge for them so they can travel back and forth, so they can travel to the past to listen to that music uh, and come back and create and build the future of Armenia. Morning in Yerevan. With a chill already in the air, we're told it's a perfect time to sample kash a traditional Armenian dish served only at breakfast. It's prepared the day before and left to simmer all night. 
And oh yeah, did we forget to tell you, it's made with cow's hooves? It's painful in the beginning, but then you realize it's part of the tradition and you have to carry on and then they start loving it. For a lesson in the art of eating kush, our team sits down with political satirist Sergei Sargsyan. We take this very seriously, okay? Hush is a ritual, it's not just meal, it's a ritual. So uh, it's also supposed to isolate you from the society for the rest of the day, so uh, it implies a lot of garlic. Then the most important part, dry lavash, uh, until it turns into a porridge substance. And then you do this. It's an apologetic so sound that you're, you know you're a sinner, you know, you're admitting you're a sinner, and then you carry on sinning. Yeah. With the early morning vodka already flowing, the conversation eventually turns to politics and the state of satire in Armenia today. We're still learning, we're still in the process. Sergei believes his show's satire is helping to put public pressure on Armenia's political elite. Reporters know that they, whatever they ask is going to end up on TV, and so they, they can't really bully the reporters. Signs of a maturing democracy? Sergei would be happy if it just made Armenian politicians smile a bit more. It's like politicians are having harsh all year round. They have their harsh faces serious, and they have to take things seriously. <sighs> For the last leg of our journey, we went in search of the Armenian diaspora. The numbers had caught our attention. Of the roughly 10 million or so Armenians alive today, only 3 million of them live inside Armenia. Many fled persecution or political instability, setting up communities around the world. But we'd heard a new generation of Armenians was coming back to reconnect with its heritage. We decided we had to tag along. But yeah, if you want to follow me, Temperamental. Tanya Akanian is a 21-year-old from Leeds, England. Her father is an Armenian born in Iran. No. Are you? No. I know I'm Armenian, but I, I still need to discover more. So I know I had this part of me that I was really proud of, but I needed to go and discover it and see why I was proud of it, because I just knew like about food and music, and that was it. Yes, My host mom, she yes, looks after me and man. cooks me lots of delicious yes, things. Man, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> every day. Tanya is here thanks to the Birthright Armenia program. Anyone between the ages of 20 and 32 who has at least one Armenian grandparent can sign up. You can see what I mean by hospitable. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting to see how they will just welcome someone in that is Armenian from a different country. Because I don't think many people in the UK would do that. I don't know. Maybe. What we're doing here is uh, getting people from outside to come and to really see firsthand for themselves this country, its potential, its challenges. And if Armenia is a big mosaic, where is, where, where's that, that little piece of the rock, that colorful little piece with their name on it? More than an immersion program, it's a chance for young professionals to engage and give back. They are expected to volunteer at least 30 hours a week. Um, for me, I didn't really know about my roots, besides some pilaf and baklava, <laughs> and like kind of vaguely knowing that that's where my grandparents came from. Justin Mayfield grew up in Boston in the United States. He shares his love of music by volunteering at the Tumo School. Learning Armenian music was one of my goals when I came here and I'm trying to implement it into my workshop uh, and trying to make the students have a way to modernize it so we want to kind of show them what's awesome about it. Birthright helps volunteers get the full Armenian experience by taking them out of their comfort zone. We catch up with the Birthright caravan in the tiny village of Yegate Nodsar. I am Antoine Stepan Terjanian, and this is my wife, Sheila. We were like you, Armenian Volunteer Corps. We came here in May 2002. We came to Armenia for the first time. Uh, our objective was to serve for one year, but we fell in love with the people. 
Uh, it was really interesting to hear Anton's story, actually, about what he said about the people being the greatest resource, because like, the one thing that is consistent everywhere in the cities and in the villages is kind of the people and like how hard they work and how everyone's got like a complicated history. I think I will, will come back and keep in touch. Tomorrow we're just gonna knock on people's doors and talk to these families. We'll try this one first. Usually it leads to like a really interesting story and something like you've never imagined someone could have gone through. <laughs> The biggest thing is like, it's, everything keeps surprising you. There's like one, one thing after another that's just like, wow. You might need some more time here. Keep an open mind and have no expectations. That's always what I'm going to say to you. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it reminded me so much of back home and growing up with my dad, like the Western Armenian cult, uh, influences. And we'd come away with dried fruits, cognac, wine. Well, you got the socks. Socks. <laughs> socks. And she was, I've got her phone number. So, as our journey through Armenia winds down, a look back at the experience reveals a country betting heavily on its youth. At every stop, signs of a new generation of Armenians ready to move beyond their parents' past and embrace a future without boundaries. And probably most memorable from our time on the road in Armenia, all the people, both young and old, who were eager to open their hearts and share their homeland.